I want to talk about um, one of the most, probably the most outrageous verse in the Bible. The most amazing verse in the Bible. The most incredible verse in the Bible, which also happens to be the very first verse in the Bible, uh, which says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Wow. Created everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Friends, we live in the 21st century. We live in a scientific age. We live in a technological age. Is it still credible for us to believe that a supernatural creator created the universe? Well, Dr. Jerry Coyne doesn't think so. See, Dr. Coyne is a professor of ecology and evolution at the University of Chicago. And he wrote an article for USA Today. And in that article, listen to what he said. He said, quote, science and faith are fundamentally incompatible. And he said, science helps religion only by disproving its claims. But is that true? I mean, I was an atheist like Dr. Coyne for much of my life. But I spent two years of my life investigating not just the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, but also the scientific evidence for whether or not Genesis 1-1 could possibly be true. And I came to the opposite conclusion of Dr. Coyne. I came to the conclusion that science, when done right, points powerfully and persuasively toward a creator who just happens to match the description of the God of the Bible. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about some scientific discoveries that have been made just within the last 50 or 60 years that point powerfully and persuasively toward the existence of a supernatural creator. And not just any supernatural creator, but the creator who's described in the book of Genesis. I want to look at three areas of science. The first area is called cosmology. Cosmology, that's a fancy term. All that means is the study of the origin of the universe. Where did the universe come from? You know, for centuries, scientists believed that the universe was eternal. It always existed. It's infinitely old. But we know from mathematics and from philosophy that an actually infinite number of past events is not possible because it would lead to absurdities and contradictions. In fact, probably the greatest mathematical mind of the last century, David Hilbert, said infinity's role is solely as an idea and that, quote, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. Philosopher William Lane Craig, a professor at Biola University as well as Houston Baptist University, uh, Dr. William Lane Craig uh, cites Hilbert and says, therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist at some point in the past. And then over the last 50 or 60 years, we've had some scientific discoveries showing that the galaxies are moving away from each other which indicates a universe that is expanding from a single point. And then measurements of the background, uh, cosmic background radiation, they all confirm that the universe at some point in the past exploded into existence. And this has convinced virtually every scientist that the universe had a sudden beginning in a cataclysmic event in the past. In a speech at Cambridge University, Dr. Alexander Vilinkin, who's the uh, director of the Institute of Cosmology at Tufts University, he looked at all the alternative models of the universe that you see mentioned in the newspaper from time to time, different ways that cosmologists try to explain the universe, the eternal inflation model, the cyclic model, the, even the cosmic egg theory, all of these theories. And he said none of them can actually be past eternal. In fact, he and two other cosmologists developed a theorem that tells us that any universe that is expanding on average through its history, like ours, must have had a beginning. Even, get this, even if our universe is just a tiny part of a bigger multiverse, the theorem suggests the multiverse itself had a beginning. 
Vilenkin concluded this, quote, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. And that leads us to what has become popularly known, thanks to Dr. William Lane Craig, who has popularized this argument for the existence of God, become popularly known as the Kalam argument for the existence of God. And it goes like this. It's very simple, just three parts. First, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now, can you think of anything that began to exist that didn't have a cause behind it? Even David Hume, the most famous skeptic of all time, said, quote, I never asserted so absurd a proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. So whatever begins to exist has a cause. Secondly, the universe began to exist. Virtually every scientist now concedes that the universe and time itself had a beginning. So, whatever begins to exist has a cause. We know the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause behind it. Now, what kind of a cause can bring a universe into existence? Well, it itself must be uncaused because you can't have an instant, infinite regress of causes, so it must be uncaused. It must be immaterial or spirit because it existed before the material world existed. It must be eternal because it was, uh, existed before time was created. It must be smart and powerful because of the precision and power of the creation event. It must have a personal will because it had to make the decision to create. And the principle of Occam's razor tells us there would be just one creator. So what have we got? We've got an uncaused, immaterial or spirit, eternal, smart, powerful, personal, one of a kind. It's a good beginning point to describe the God of the Bible. The Bible puts it this way in Psalm 102, verse 25. In the beginning, you, God, laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. So I think cosmology goes a long way toward establishing the existence of a creator. But there are two challenges that are often raised by skeptics. The first challenge is this. We say whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And they will say to you, oh, well, if God created the universe, then what created God? And that's usually followed by na 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 Because they think they got you with that. Oh, yeah, well, then who created God? Well, the answer to that is nobody created God. The argument is not whatever exists has a cause. That's not the argument. The argument is whatever begins to exist has a cause. God, by definition, is eternal. He never began to exist. He has always existed. You see, before he created the universe, time didn't even exist. There was simply timelessness. Now, atheists shouldn't have a problem with something being eternal because they used to claim that the universe was eternal until science disproved them. So they shouldn't have a problem with something being eternal. And that thing that is eternal is God. The second objection, uh, Stephen Hawking, the famous... Um, uh, astrophysicist, raises in his book called The Grand Design. And he puts it this way. He said, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Let me say that again. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. In other words, God didn't create the universe. The universe created itself out of nothing. Now, the problem with that is it simply cre uh, postpones creation by one stage. In other words, if gravity caused the world to pop into existence by itself from nothing, where did gravity come from? Who made gravity? <laughs> How did that get put there? We still need a creator. And so Hawking's theory fails to do away with God. On the contrary, the beginning of the universe points toward the existence of a creator. Related to this is a book that's gained a lot of popularity by an atheist, a very adamant atheist, 
by the name of Lawrence Krauss, a professor uh, at the University of Arizona. He wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing. And in that book, he claims the universe was created by nothing and from nothing. But then he uses a little sleight of hand. He says the universe was created by nothing, from nothing, but then he redefines nothing as something. <laughs> and he doesn't account for where that something came from. Now, you'll see Lawrence Krauss quoted a lot, but I would encourage you, if you think that his book is persuasive, to go to the New York Times. The New York Times is no friend to people who believe that God created the universe. And yet, they included a review of his book by David Albert, who's an astrophysicist from Columbia University. And he wrote a scathing review of Dr. Krauss's book. And he isn't the only one. Another physicist by the name of George Ellis, very prominent, he actually co-wrote a book with Stephen Hawking. He said, quote, Krauss is presenting untested speculative theories and philosophical speculation, and he doesn't explain why the laws of physics exist in the first place or why they have to form the way they do. He gives no experimental or observational process whereby we could test these vivid speculations. And then Scientific American magazine said the book, quote, recycles a bunch of stale ideas from physics and cosmology. Friends, I think William Lane Craig was right when he said, in a sense, the history of 20, 20th century cosmology can be seen as a series of one failed attempt after another to avoid the absolute beginning predicted by the standard Big Bang model. He said, this parade of failed theories only serves to confirm the predictions of the model that the universe began to exist. So I think the evidence of cosmology is powerful and persuasive in pointing toward a creator. Amen. The second area I want to look at is the area of physics. Of physics. One of the striking discoveries of the last 50 or 60 years in physics has been that the laws and the constants of physics, in other words, the numbers that govern the operation of the universe, unexpectedly conspire in an absolutely extraordinary way to make the universe habitable for life. In other words, the universe is finely tuned on a razor's edge in a way that defies mere chance and is better explained as the work of a creator. It's like if you go out at night and it's one of those real dark nights and you see all the stars in the sky and, and you walk out at night and instead of seeing a, a sky full of stars, you see a sky full of dials. A hundred dials all over the sky and each dial has millions, some of them billions, some of them trillions of possible settings on each of these hundred dials in the sky. And every one of these hundred dials is absolutely calibrated to the exact precision so that life can exist. That is the picture of the world that we get from contemporary physics. Let me give you some examples. Each of those dials represents a parameter of physics that's finely tuned. One of them is the force of gravity. We all know what gravity is. Um, and gravity, the force of gravity, is finely tuned to an incomprehensible degree so that life can exist. How finely tuned is it? Imagine a ruler that stretches across the entire universe, 15 billion light years, a, like, a, like just a ruler, and it's broken down in one-inch increments. That represents plausibly the range along which the force of gravity could be calibrated, anywhere along there. But it is calibrated along that dial at the exact right place so that life can exist. How precise is it? If you were to change the force of gravity one inch compared to the 15 billion light year width of the universe, one inch intelligent life would be impossible anywhere in the universe. That is just mind-boggling how finely tuned that just that one parameter is. Another example is what's called the cosmological constant. Sounds like a fancy term. It just means the energy density of space. 
Uh, now, you know, it sounds technical, but what you need to know about the cosmological con um, um, constant is it needs to be balanced on a razor's edge in order for the universe to exist. If the number of the cosmological constant were large and positive, galaxies and stars and planets would not exist. If it were large and negative, the entire universe would just collapse upon itself. But it has to be exactly calibrated to the perfect place so that life can exist. How perfectly does it need to be calibrated? It has to be finely tuned to one part in a hundred million billion 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 billion. How finely tuned is that? That is so finely tuned. That would be like going on the moon and taking a dart and throwing it at planet Earth and hitting a predetermined bullseye that is one trillionth of a trillionth of an inch in diameter, the size of one atom. That is how finely tuned the cosmological constant is. Now, he said there's about 100 of these dials. Just take the force of gravity and the cosmological constant and put those two together and the precision, the fine-tuning is so precise. It's so precise to, a, to a, a level of one part in a hundred million trillion 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 trillion. That's equal to one atom in the entire known universe. Friends, the universe is not an accident. This doesn't happen by chance. You look at those numbers and a, and a scientist will tell you, you know what that numbers tells you? It is impossible for that to happen by chance. It ain't ever going to happen by chance. The numbers are too, and that's just two of the parameters. We can go to others. For instance, the odds against the initial conditions being suitable for the formation of stars is a one followed by a thousand billion billion zeros. Incredible. Then there's the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force binds the nucleus of atoms together. If you were dec to decrease the strong nuclear force by just one part in 10,000 billion, 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 all you would have in the universe would be hydrogen and life would be impossible. That's just absolutely staggering how everything is perfectly calibrated so you and I can sit here tonight. I'll give you one other one. This may be my favorite. Get this. It's the ratio of the electromagnetic force to the gravitational force. It's an you know, a, a, a expression of physics that they measure. The ratio of the electromagnetic force to the gravitational force. It is fine-tuned to one part in 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. Now, how do we understand that number? Well, an astrophysicist has computed it. So, just this one dial that we're talking about now, the ratio of the electromagnetic force to the gravitational force, this one dial, just this one, is so finely tuned that it would be like taking a continent the size of North America and stacking it all over with dimes that run all the way up to the moon. 238,000 miles. So can you picture this? North America, all it is is dimes piled up to the moon. Got that picture in your mind? Now multiply that to a billion North Americas, all with dimes that go all the way up to the moon. Now, take one dime and spray paint it red and mix it up against all the dimes on the billion North Americas with 238,000 miles of dimes going up. Take one dime, spray paint it red, put it in there. Now, blindfold a friend and tell him he can duck his hand in among these billion North American continents to all of these dimes going all the way up to the moon, and he can only pick out at random one dime. What are the odds, do you think, he would pick that red dime? The same odds that the ratio of the electromagnetic force would be appropriate to the gravitational force. That's how finely tuned it is. He'd have one chance of doing that in 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. Friends, this has absolutely staggered physicists as they discovered this. 
um, Vera Kiskiakowski, who was a former professor of physics at MIT and former president of the Association of Women in Science, said this, the exquisite order displayed by our scientific understanding of our physical world calls for the divine. In other words, you look at this and say, there must be a God behind this to calibrate this. In fact, one of the most famous British cosmologists, Edward Harrison, a professor at Amherst, whose books are published by Oxford University Press and by um, Harvard University Press, said this, quote, here is the cosmological proof of the existence of God. He said the fine-tuning of the universe provides prima facie evidence of deistic design. To him, this proves the existence of God. Now, how do you get around this if you're an atheist? Ah, there's a way. There's a way to get around it. You know how they get around it? They say, well, what if this isn't the only universe? What if there's actually an infinite number of universes, and all of them have hundreds of dials, but if you have an infinite number, and you spin the dials in an infinite number of universes, sooner or later, one of them is going to come up, and we hit the cosmic jackpot, it's us. Seriously, that is the only explanation for this. Now, here's the problem with that. There is absolutely zero, nada, no evidence that there is an infinite number of other universes that exist. There is no evidence for that. In fact, a new book on this by an atheist cosmologist admits it's just an untested hypothesis. Besides, get this, if one universe requires an explanation, then an infinite number of universes requires an even bigger explanation, and that points even more powerfully toward God. So, honestly, friends, I think if you just look at the evidence of cosmology and physics and put it together, that is enough for me. I agree with, with Dr. Harrison that it's enough for me to convince me that there is a supernatural creator. But I'm going to give you one other area, because um, this, this one blows my mind as well. Uh, and that is the area of DNA, or biological information. You know, not too many years ago, scientists, led, by the way, by an evangelical Christian, mapped the entire human genome. That is, the chemical instructions inside every cell that contained the blueprint for life. And when that was announced by President Clinton at the time, listen to what he said, quote, Today, we are learning the language in which God created life. And he is exactly right. DNA is quite literally language. You know, your body has a hundred trillion cells in it. Choose one cell at random, one cell, and open it up. And if you were to uncoil the DNA in that one cell... It would be six feet tall in every cell in your body. That stretch of DNA is encoded with a four-character chemical alphabet that spells out the precise assembly instructions for all of the proteins out of which your body is made. You see, DNA is the most efficient information storage system in the universe. If you had one teaspoon of DNA, picture peanut butter, you know, and a teaspoon of peanut butter, picture that as being one teaspoon of pure DNA. If you had that, it would have the capacity to store all of the information needed to build all of the proteins for all of the 1,000 million species of organisms that have ever lived and have room left over for all the information in every book that's ever been written in one teaspoon of DNA. Now, how does DNA point toward a creator? Well, has anybody here, and I'm not expecting a huge response to this, has anybody here seen the movie Contact? And, oh, wow, quite a few. That's, that's pretty good, isn't it? It's worth writing, I think. Uh, Jodie Foster's in it. She went to Yale, yeah. And um, so, Contact is a movie 
based on a book by an atheist, Carl Sagan, who was an astronomer. And it's fiction, but it's based, it has some truth in it. And the, the, the true part of the book is that there is an effort by the government to try to determine, is there intelligent life somewhere in the universe, somewhere else in the universe? And so how do they determine that? Well, they have these radio telescopes that scan the sky looking for intelligent life. I wish they would point them toward Washington, D.C. I just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But, but I digress, I digress. But they, they got these radio telescopes pointing toward the heavens, trying to find, is there any intelligent life out there? Um, now, normally, and all they've ever received, these radio telescopes, is static. Just the, the, the general background noise, unorganized static that you get from the sound of the universe. And it's reasonable to assume that static means there's probably, you know, certainly no communication going on here. But in the movie, here's the fictional part, in the movie one day, these radio telescopes are scanning the sky and, uh oh, what's this? They start to detect the transmission of prime numbers. Prime numbers are numbers that uh, are divisible only by themselves or the number one. And they conclude from that that there can't be just natural causes behind that. The general background radiation and, 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 and static of the universe didn't organize itself into prime numbers. There must be information there. It's information. It wasn't unorganized static. It was information. It was a message with content. And from that, in the movie, they conclude there must be an intelligence transmitting these prime numbers. The author, Carl Sagan, the atheist, said, the receipt of a single message from space would be enough to know there's an intelligence out there. Friends, what is DNA? It is a message with content. It is language. It is information. Just as English uses a 26-letter alphabet to spell out words, DNA uses a four-letter chemical alphabet. Inside, get this, inside every cell of your body, the 100 trillion cells, inside every cell is as many words as in nearly 200 years of the Sunday New York Times, spelled out in these four letter, this four-letter chemical alphabet in DNA. If you were to read the code in the DNA, in every cell of your body, if you were to read it out loud at three letters a second and you did it night and day, it would take you 31 years to read the information in just one cell in your body. 31 years to read the code aloud. What is it? It is the specific, detailed, written instructions for how to build all of the proteins out of which your body is made. Friends, if a single message from space, one sentence from space, is enough for us to conclude there must be an intelligence behind it, what about this vast amount of information that is contained in the DNA in every person? It's like God signed every cell in your body. You see, nature by itself can produce patterns but it can't produce information. In other words, if you go down to Galveston and you're walking down the beach and you see ripples in the sand, you could logically conclude that that pattern of those ripples was made by the waves coming on shore because nature can create patterns like that. But if you're walking down the beach and you see John loves Mary and a heart around it and an arrow through it, you would never say, oh, the waves made that. Because nature can produce patterns, but it can't produce information. It can't produce information. And wherever we see information, wherever we see it, whether it's in a book, whether it's a computer code, whether it's a newspaper, wherever we see information, always, 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 there is an intelligence behind it. King David put it this way in Psalm 139. 
For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And there is plenty of evidence, friends, from 21st century science to know that full well. And it's not just Christians with a predisposition to believe this stuff who become convinced by this evidence. The most famous atheist of the last century, arguably, was Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew taught on atheism. By the way, he wrote a book, a landmark book called The Presumption of Atheism. And he taught on atheism at major universities all over Europe and the United States. Uh, wrote, what, 17 books. Um, just a, you know, one of the top, probably the, the, the top philosophic, philosophical atheist of his generation. So one day, I'm reading the New York Times a few years ago, and there on the front page it says, Anthony Flew, the greatest atheist in the universe, just said, oops, I was wrong. Sorry. God, you know, exists. Now, I'm a skeptic. My background's in journalism and law. you got to prove it to me. And I thought the New York Times, I thought this was fake news. I thought this can't possibly be true. Because when I was an atheist, Anthony Flew was one of my heroes. So I tracked him down. And I sat him down. And I said, Dr. Flew, you're the, you were the greatest atheist of your generation. Fifty years you taught atheism. And now you say, oops, I was wrong? Tell me in one sentence why you changed your mind. And this is what he told me. He said, quote, he said, Lee, for one thing, it's the integrated complexity of the biological world. The exact kind of stuff we were just talking about. The integrated complexity of the biological world. He later wrote a book on this topic. Let me read to you his conclusion. He said, I now believe that the universe was brought into existence by an infinite intelligence. I believe that this universe's intricate laws manifest... By the way, that's cosmology right there, right? The universe was brought into existence by an infinite intelligence. Then he said, I believe that this universe's intricate laws manifest what scientists have called the mind of God. That's the physics evidence we talked about. He said, I believe that life and reproduction originate in a divine source. He said, why do I believe this? Given that I expounded and defended atheism for more than half a century? He said, the short answer is this. This is the world picture as I see it that has emerged from modern science. And I came to the same conclusion. I mean, I came to realize that if I were to maintain my atheism, I would need to believe that nothing produces everything, that non-life produces life, that randomness produces fine-tuning, that chaos produces information, that unconsciousness produces consciousness, and that non-reason produces reason. And friends, I just did not have enough faith to continue to believe that. I mean, I think you can just look. There's other things we could look at. The origin of life. There's so many. The, the conditions of, of, of Earth, how there's 322, I think it is, parameters that allow life to exist on planet Earth. It's, Earth itself is finely tuned. And we could go on and on. But you know what? It turns out that Romans 1.20 is right. When it says, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. They say through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Friends, I'm thankful that modern science when done right, when done in an impartial way, where you let the evidence take you in a direction regardless of where you want it to go, 
and you follow it to its logical conclusions. I am so thankful that modern science points us toward the existence of a creator who just happens to match the portrait of the God of the Bible. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you have wonderfully made us, that you have wonderfully made this universe. I mean, when we look at the sky, we look through a telescope, and we see the wonders of the universe. We look at the photographs that the Hubble satellite takes, and we're in awe of what you created. And then we look in a, in a microscope, and we see the incredible source of information for the development of life there, spelled out in DNA, as if you signed every cell personally, and we are in awe of you. You are a great and a magnificent and a mighty God. And when we ask ourselves, well, why did he do it? Why did he so carefully calibrate this entire universe so that we could be here? You created us so that we could have a relationship with you forever. We thank you for that. We thank you that you loved us so much that you created a habitat for us to inhabit where we can thrive and we can get to know you personally. And as we come to you through your son, Jesus Christ, in repentance and faith, that we can know you in this world and then forever in the world to come. Our minds can't grasp all that you have done. Our minds can't grasp all that you are. We only know what you've told us, and it's enough. It's enough for us to be in a state of wonder and worship and celebration of who you are. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together to talk about important stuff. Thank you that we don't have to check our minds at the door as we come to faith but that the evidence of science and history point conclusively to you. I remember as an atheist spending two years looking at the evidence and then stepping back and seeing that it was like a jigsaw puzzle. And when it was all together, it was a portrait of your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent into the world to redeem us, to save us, to bring us home to you. We thank you for that. Thank you for this great church. Thank you for the way it's like, you know, we talked about last night, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, that spreads your message of hope and grace and love all over the planet. We thank you for that. We thank you for the leaders here, the volunteers, the congregation. We thank you for each person here that we might emerge from this conference ever more passionate and ever more equipped to be stronger salt and brighter light to a world that desperately needs you. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.